Hey everyone, welcome back to Rally Caps. It's a podcast for artists, entrepreneurs, and everybody in between. I'm Steven. I'm Gene. I'm Eric. And today we are doing a special episode, our first Q&A episode. You guys excited? Yeah. I'm yeah. just so far away from Gene <laughs> and you. I know, that's why you're looking at me. <laughs> it's going to be like great. Far? This is a cool variation of the set, but I just want to be physically closer, closer to you guys. <laughs> Which we will get to soon. This is already different than last week's episode. Doing a little three-person setup versus what Eric and I did last week for two. We'll have a better couch soon. Love seat. Love seat. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Love seat. Nice. <laughs> nice. That's sick. Uh, yeah, a couple of weeks back, we put out an open call for questions for you guys to ask us to answer on an episode for a live Q&A kind of situation. So we've got all those questions here. We're going to go through them, shout everybody out as we go along. And before we jump into it, if you are listening and you love the show or even just like it a little, maybe consider sharing it with a friend, leaving a rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all those good places. If you're on YouTube watching it, a little like, subscribe action. It'd be amazing. We'd really appreciate it. You guys ready? Ready. Yeah. Sick. <laughs> you're giving this really weird energy. <laughs> Dude, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm so, t- I'm so right tired. <laughs> okay, first up on that <laughs> great note, uh, one of my buddies, Jacob Padilla. Thank you, Jacob, for hey, asking Jacob. a question. What design idea for the new studio space do you love but someone else hates? Why do you guys look at me? Uh-oh. Gene, obviously. You yeah, answer each first. Answer. Me first? Uh-huh. Uh, that honestly, you, that... that we love yeah like an individual likes but maybe isn't their personal favorite decision this is where compromising comes in mm, as a studio of people you know mm, making design choices together having to compromise a little bit sometimes i literally have nothing same yeah same. i, like <laughs> I every, thought it'd be a good I, question a like yeah, it's a great yeah. question it it's is just a, very a really boring one. answer yep. I, yeah like i think that's the beauty of the three of us being in this space is yep. that we don't have that strong of preference on what it has to be. And we also have the same design philosophies across the board. Like it's very easy for us to come to an agreement on things because we all like the same stuff. Yeah. You know, which is I great. think it's maybe more of a functional disagreement with yeah. like building things. Cause I'm always a person like, it'll mm. be fine. <laughs> that's a good point actually. And yes. not, that's so. true. Yeah. He's yeah, always yeah. like, let's like make sure it's fine. I'm like, it'll be fine. And it usually is. Sometimes. Usually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael Rieger, another friend. Sorry. I put this question your, and answer poll on, on my story. personal story. So, yeah. Uh, Mike Rieger, thanks so much. Uh, oh, it's not even a question. Uh, you're just the coolest. I miss you, buddy. I miss you too, man. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. All right. Nice. Perfect. Next. Um, at H-H-A-A-N-N-E-E-S-S underscore 24. Haynes? Haynes. Haynes underscore 24. As Haynes a young photographer. Under where? As, <laughs> uh, Haynes 24 asks, as a young photographer, what's the best way to learn from the pros? YouTube. Honestly. YouTube. Like yeah. there are, the majority of pros aren't on YouTube, but there are some that are and give free advice and education. Mm-hmm. I think the common thing that a lot of online educators, whether it be in a creative space, photography, filmmaking, or literally anything else, we'll, we'll always talk about the fact that most of what you need to learn in any profession, any craft will be found on Google and YouTube. But if you want to buy a course or education, it's it's literally just for the curation of that without yeah. having to do the research on your own. So it's, you know, what are you willing to invest in? Are you willing to invest in it with your money? Or are you willing to invest your time? Because it'll probably take 10 to 20 times as long for you to find all of it, find the right people, find the right subjects, as opposed to like buying something. So a lot of times if you're, you know, if you're just starting off, you don't have the funds to, to be able to purchase something of mm-hmm. that quality, which a lot of online courses are super high quality, at least the premium ones are. Yep. And the truth of the matter is pretty much all that information exists on the internet in some capacity, but you got to hunt for it. Yep. And it might take you literally years to like find all of it. Agreed. Yeah. Anything nope. from Eugene? No, I think everything's online now. So it's if you want to learn, you just have to have the desire to go find it, and it's there. Love it. Next question from Daniel Ellender, 
who Eric and I met yeah. in LA like two months ago yeah. now. Uh, super fun. Thanks for asking a question, he's, Daniel. He's really getting after it. Yes, he is. And he's probably going to visit here at some point exciting. soon too. It's exciting. Uh, do you give your podcast guests the question list in advance or is it all off the cuff? It's, it's kind of a mix of both. It's off the cuff unless they ask for questions. Yeah. I don't think we ever send them a list, but we make a list for ourselves. An hour before recording. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just the being frantic, honest, man. The, the frantic text. Hey, do we have any questions? Dude, I've, lined I've up? literally <laughs> written questions five minutes before jumping on a Zoom. Before that was like two years ago, but like I don't know. I feel like I do well under pressure in that sense. Yeah. But we try to keep it conversational, so it doesn't... I mean, the yeah, questions yeah. just come up naturally. I don't even think it's a question list that we stick to so much as broad topics that we can broach and yeah. then feel free to explore different forks in the road from there. We're Yeah, we're never going to like hit them with some controversial question. Or like end a conversation just to weirdly segue into another question. Yeah. Just let's go with the flow of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't like when podcasts do that. It bothers me when there's pod, like there's breaks in podcasts yeah. where nothing is said. And then they go, <laughs> so. so. <laughs> oh, yeah. It drives me nuts. Uh, yeah. And that's something yep. I think we do really well. We kind of transition out. of. If we feel that coming on, one of us will just like take the reins and yeah. transition it. Which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Right, uh, Gene? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, as a more recent addition to the show, you have not experienced that quite yet. Okay, Gene yeah. must answer the next one. Yes, Gene, this one's for you from Nate Black at the Nate Black on Instagram. Hey, All-time favorite photo that you've taken or that someone else has taken. Oh, Ooh, dang. That's tough. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> filler, 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 filler. I don't, I don't know if to date I've... I've had a photo where I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the best piece of work I've photographed so far mm. in my career so far. Um, as far as other people though, I think I'm, I'm always coming across new people's work, people that I haven't seen before who are creating incredible things. But um, like right off the bat, I don't think I've, I don't, I haven't, I don't think, not yet at least. Okay. Yeah. There's nothing else, someone else, like a film photograph that like really, Maybe not even just your favorite of all time, yeah. but something that really made you rethink, make a decision on something. You're like, oh, I need, I want to get that lens or I need to follow this person's work. One that comes to mind is that Willem photo. The yeah, the tree, tree one. Yeah, yeah, that one like I can picture in my head right now. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, we will show it to you. Yeah. I can't find it. It's, can you it's describe pretty, it, please? Um, it is a photo of a tree. I don't know what time of day it was taken yeah. at, but it was very foggy either. and it has this incredible surge of warm light on the left and yeah. cool light on the right. And it looks just bananas. And I feel like part of the reason it's so cool is because it was taken on film and the ambient tones were really emphasized. Crazy. So I imagine at least as an outsider, having no idea how it was actually made, it was probably during a sunset or golden That's hour my guess. sunrise time yeah. of day but it wasn't hitting the entire frame. Yeah. It looks like out of this world. Yeah. It's, it is so cool. It's very cool. I need yeah. to see that. It's yeah. very cool. What about um, you, Steven? Do I have one? Yeah. Of your own? Not really. <clears throat> I feel like, I feel like they kind of come up as I take them <clears throat> where I'll, you know, like make a new, a new image and I think, oh, like this is, this is going in the personal portfolio, but it's not necessarily like, oh, this one edges out yeah. all of the others, like by a mile for sure. I've peaked until you get to the next moment. I think they're just standout images that I can look back on from where I'm at right now. One of them to be more specific and not just kind of meta about all of it. Um, the nine image stitch that I oh, took yeah, of El Cap for sure. in Yosemite. Mm -hmm. I love like that's definitely a portfolio image for me. I absolutely love it. It was a complicated technique. I wasn't sure if it would work. So happy with the results. Like it was beyond what I expected it could have Did it get been. the most likes on Instagram? No, it did not. What it, is the it most did, likes? It did really well. What is the biggest traffic image? The portraits of you guys, the Brenizer. That's what, yeah. I figured. Yeah. Got almost 20,000 likes. I was going to, I was going to bring that one up. Yeah. Mm. That's up there. I, think I mean, all those, those are some of the coolest there. portraits you've I, ever taken. I love those. Those are absolutely up there. Um, and then 
a lot of photos from Italy also. That mm. will be yeah. personal, special images too. What about other, another photo? For another you? photo from me that I've taken or someone else? Someone else. else. Someone else. Hmm. I've seen so many photos, you know? Yeah. We've all seen a lot of photos. Mm -hmm. It can be hard to think about them on the spot, actually. You don't have to. I have two lined up for me. Ooh. I will also yeah. say a Willem image. It is the cover image of his Walking Svalbard book. Oh, I, from Norway? Mm -hmm. It's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. It's around, I think, sunrise, and it's this red house. There's snow falling. It's got a glow behind it. It's just spectacular. So two, absolutely two landscapes for you guys. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. My, I think one that really stands out for me is the portrait of Matt and Meg, the silhouette with uh, tilt shift stars. I, think that oh, one, I featured that yeah, one in yeah. one of my recent YouTube videos. There's like a, just a really special story involved with that on a personal level. They're close friends of ours. Our families went on a trip together on that trip. I shot that shoot for free. It, it just felt like the, it felt like the pinnacle of my creativity and photography kind mm -hmm. of like, I just could not believe that the image came out like that. Yeah. And there's, there's a handful more kind of like that as far as creative portraits go. But one image that really stands out to me is Brad Butcher's street crossing photo. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I that one's that, crazy. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It is... Yeah. It is like... It is the best composed photograph I've ever seen. And it's a street image. And it just is... Every single part of the frame is filled with something interesting. Mm -hmm. And the spacing is perfect... There's a perfect ellipse of five people, three guys crossing a puddle. It's just, yeah, it all in full stride at the same time. Like it is truly a one in a billion shot. Yeah, that that image will never be recreated yeah, in that exact way. I know. It's it, incredible. Yeah, it's it's just insane. Even like it's one of those even where like there's a FedEx truck in between mm -hmm. one of the guys' separated legs, like perfectly centered. Mm -hmm. Like just weird, crazy symmetry and composition in the image. Yeah. And I think what I really love about it too is just how interesting photography can be in that kind of situation is that he didn't aim for it to be that perfect. Mm -hmm. It was literally just something he saw quickly, uh, had, had no idea how powerful the image was until he even got the scans back because yeah, it was on right. film. And in his head, he was probably like, that was an incredible photo. And then he gets it back and it's just like, this is unfathomable. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of film That's, a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, another, I feel like it, for me, my favorite, if I were to pick one, it would have to be on film kind of for that reason. Yeah. Just so like, like people, someone wasn't, you know, shooting 15, 20 variations of it to get it perfect. Yeah. But rather just like one shot, have no idea if it was perfect or not. And then the feeling of seeing it later multiplies the excitement for it yeah. by a hundred. Mm-hmm. More so than if you took, yeah, yeah, like you said, 20 variations and edited all of them immediately. And it just has a really indescribable value. I guess to it. in that sense for me too, the photos I just took at Disney were kind of like that as totally. well. Yeah. Yeah, they're great. I think of family vacation stuff often when this question is asked, even though I didn't mention those. But yeah, they're really special. Okay, moving on. Jake. H. Re photo, Jake Re photo. What practice or lesson improved your photography the most? Shooting film. I might have to agree with that. I'm really enjoying watching Gene think right now. <laughs> yeah, no, shooting film for <laughs> sure. I mean, I think... My work has been shaped so much by like you guys, by the people that I surround myself mm -hmm. with. Um, not that we all shoot in a very similar way, but just the amount of times that we've over the years shown each other our work or what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Um, just the constant feedback, the constant affirmation as well, I think has largely shaped how I photograph. But film, for sure, from a technical perspective, 100%, it's film. I agree with that. I think from a technical perspective too, starting to shoot film and understand how it works really forces your brain to understand how digital photography works as well. Because once you come to the realization that a film camera is just a box that holds film and that really what only matters uh, quality wise is the glass you shoot the image through in film and the stock that's in the camera, like 
the camera really truly isn't doing anything outside of the function um, of taking the picture and how much you'd like taking the picture with that box. Yeah. And then alternatively recognizing that that light coming through that lens and burning onto that organic substance, which is film, is recreated in the digital space by a digital sensor being that quote unquote film. And then all of those photons being uh, transitioned into data, literal data, ones and zeros mm -hmm. that are written to a memory card. I think when, when I finally came to that realization, I understood like shooting films and seeing like, oh wait, there's no sensor inside this camera. Mm -hmm. And then realizing, wait, that's what my digital camera is doing. Like yeah. It's literally reading light through the lens and turning it into data. It was, that was pretty mind blowing for me to like, and then once you're empowered with that kind of knowledge, then I feel like that's when you really can start playing with variables in a significant way for creativity and mm. function. And that goes for anything you do in life is like that deeper understanding of the subject matter, the medium mm. will really start to allow you to do more complex things. Very similar in music as well. Mm -hmm. Just becomes another language. Agreed. Yeah. I think having access to formats that don't exist in the digital world by way of medium format film and large format film and being able to literally make images that are unachievable with digital sensors is really exciting because it opens up so many possibilities as an artist. And I think it also makes you a lot more decisive because there is a dollar value to mm -hmm. each image that you shoot as you go through film and get it developed and processed and scanned or you scan it yourself or whatever it is, you know, you become a more decisive photographer because of that. And you really start to, I think, hone your eye a lot more. And that's extremely valuable. I think there's a lot to be learned in just the process of figuring out how to be almost culling in camera. You're not just used to the three, four or 5,000 photos that you can just burst off because your camera can, because it's really technically impressive. It's really cool to just sit and feel like you are making an image rather than just snapping a shutter button over and over and over. Yeah. And although the process is quick, there's a lot of overlap or connection to like being an illustrator or mm -hmm. a painter in that sense, because you're making a physical photograph. The negative you are making is a little physical thing that exists Yep. and not just data. Yep. Sweet. Uh, at excess, E-X-E-S-S-E, -E -S -S -E, just said studio tour. And hey, we have that now. It's mm -hmm. on Eric's YouTube channel. We will link it in the show notes for this episode. Go have check we been it out. linking everything every time yes. you say that? Yep. Okay, good. Almost. Um, <laughs> at Holy Holy asks, YouTube strategy question, one high quality video a month or three to four vlog style videos per month? I already know what Eric's answer is going to be. <laughs> That's what I was going to yeah. say. Yeah. I figure, I mean, you guys know what I'll say. Yeah. You're going to say one high quality a month? What do you be, yeah, Gene? Yeah, I mean, I would lean in that direction as well. I think it depends, too, on the content that you make. Yeah. Um, and there's seasons to what's popular on the platform. Uh, like, vlog. yeah. I mean, vlogs were really popular, I think, a few years back. And not that they're not popular now, but, yeah, I would agree with Eric that um, higher quality can garner you more views than just a bunch of okay videos. Yeah, I think the yeah. genre that you're in definitely will dictate this more yeah. than anything else, but generally speaking, make high quality things if you can. And also I th think stay away from vlogs. I don't know how helpful that actually is to do yeah. vlog style stuff. We don't do that really at all, unless it's a special occasion that we're making something for, but I think generally try to just make high quality stuff and maybe that's three to four high quality videos a month versus one, just depending on what it is that you're making. But I think in some sense, some people use the word vlog as synonymous to easy video. Easy that like video. doesn't plan, doesn't require planning. Mm. That just kind of documents what you're doing sometimes. So I don't a vlog. Know. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but maybe in the midst of that, it's not a vlog because you're sitting down and talking to camera and sure. yeah, shooting yeah. B-roll and talking about this object or whatever. Yep. My, I mean, if I'm just going to give a one sentence, one sentence answer, it is definitely one quality video a month versus three to four. But the nuance to that is 
one quality video a month if you have a healthy version of self-awareness and recognizing that you're capable of like standing out with making that high quality video if your intent is to grow the channel. Yeah, if you're you just have, doing it to do it, do whatever you want. Yeah. But if you want growth on YouTube, if you want to up subscribers, get your videos into recommended, you have to have a really healthy form of self-awareness and recognizing does my skill set match up with the best quality content in this sphere. And if so, and you're able to like vet that with community and people around you and like in a healthy way, assess how your work stands to other people in your genre. And like you have the confidence to be like, I can make that or I can make that better. Then I'd say go after the one video a month. Otherwise, I think if you're early on and you're just trying to like get the thing going, I think it's really valuable to do three or four a month. Yep. And just like get your reps in and get better at the craft. And then like give yourself the ability to grow into a one month, one video a month type of person later on. Yeah. Because if you if you set the standard of like no I only make one video a month and this is, and it's super high quality and it takes me twenty days to make and you're setting a precedent for yourself on that channel that the viewers are going to have of you and so anytime you make a really easy video they're gonna be like I didn't sign up for this yeah I think of people like Gox yeah hundred percent you have to be top or Mark Rober one percent of one percent to get away with the one a month you have to yeah. blow people's minds when you do that and generally those people that stick to it do. Mark Rober, I think, is a phenomenal example of that. He makes 10 to 12 videos a year, and yeah. every single one is the same quality every time. Mm -hmm. And it's mind-blowing. Yep. Agreed. Same with Beast. I mean, like, what you say what you want about him. That I mean, it's, it's a whole different ballgame, obviously. Like, you're not if you're just starting off on YouTube trying to grow, you're not Mr. Beast. You're not Mark 100 Rober. 100 employees. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but people who are intentionally doing it well... I. I mean, if you look at me, I'm, I'm really only making one to two a month at this point. Yeah. Like, I might up frequency soon, but the more and more we are diversifying our ability to make money in different ways, I feel less and less inclined to the need to post regularly. Right. I just don't need to, and I don't really care to. I'm not yeah. that interested in it. So. Word. Uh, at Renzograph asks, what's your fave analog camera? Gene, kick us off. Ooh. Um... A Mia 7. Nice. Really? Over M6? Yeah. Because, like, I'm always blown away by the, the sharpness mm. and uh, just the detail in medium format in general. But that camera, I mean, I shoot on the M6 more now just because of cost and accessibility. But the Mia 7, like, every time I see those images, if I've nailed what I had in my head when I took the photo, like, I'm always blown away. I was thinking of, like, if we do... If we sh do a movie poster shoot with Joe for the doc, mm -hmm. I, that's immediately what I thought of shooting it on. Yeah. I was like, let's shoot it on six by seven. And I'm like, do we borrow Brax's Pentax? Pentax? And then I was like, no, let's shoot on the movie. It'll be so, so sharp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll have wiggle room with shooting F4. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what's yours? I well, would say Mamiya 7 if I had one. Really? I don't. I love that camera though. It's wow. amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, right now it's the M6. Yeah, it is. That's honeymoon phase right now. Yeah. You think it'll be that long term or what? Or at least for a few years? Until I get an Amiya 7. But clearly <laughs> your 645 AFD was that before. I think it the still, M6. I think it still is my workhorse. Yeah. I think the M6, I'm just loving it currently because I'm experiencing a side of photography that I've never experienced before. And that is really exciting. Like it's hard not to say that when I'm just in the thick of it right now. Yeah. And it's super fun. Yep. I absolutely love it. It's amazing. Yep. But yeah, my AFD is like... Ride or die. Ride or die. Yeah, it's got to be. It's amazing. Yeah. It's such a good camera. Love that thing. What's yours? Me? Yeah. It's M6 also. M6. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, mine is always hit or miss. M6. This my M6. Oh, oh, you're, oh, oh, got you, got yeah. you. Yes. But yeah. I mean, I just put five, six clean rolls through it and... I brought my AF, my six for five AF as well on yeah. that trip, and I shot like five photos with it. Mm -hmm. so they're like, I don't want to carry this around. Yeah, I'm like on the go. I had short strap on my chest all day long. I was able to like throw it in the little carrying case on roller coasters at Disney. Yep, and I'm like it's just with me the entire day, and because of that, I made some of my favorite images on film ever. Yep, that's there's super just, valuable. There's just no comparison. I don't care if it's lower resolution. Yep. Yeah. 
It's just, it's just fun. It's still full frame. It's just lower it's, resolution. It's, it's still yeah. beautiful images. Once you get used to medium format, it's hard to go That's back. That's what it is, but, yeah. yeah. But That's I feel amazing. like I now focus more on the M6 than I do on the AF. Yeah. I, sometimes, like, because I'm always tempted to just shoot it at 2.8, and right. then yeah. I, like, just miss it slightly, and I'm like, well, that was a waste of $2. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah wow that is a, a brutal way to think about it <laughs> at david bowdler asks do you three develop your own film if so do you have any tips for starting to develop and scan your film we do not anymore develop our own film we can we can but it was a short season because we shoot too much of it and mm -hmm. it honestly is not worth our time to spend actually like getting through everything and making sure chemicals are good and the cleanup and temperature interrupting the flow of the studio also because it takes up so much space in our entire kitchenette for a lot of reasons it just didn't make sense for us to do anymore but we do still scan all of our own film and we use negative supply gear for all of that with mm -hmm. our canon r5s the rf 100 macro we will absolutely be making a more detailed video about this very soon uh, so stay tuned for that but yeah we do scan all of our own film yeah. and we love scanning our own film it yeah. is amazing and a flatbed scanner is a really good entry point you yeah. just have to be you just have to be all right with waiting a long time to get those images my entry into it was an epson v600 excellent scanner takes forever oh. so yeah i think the value that you get from spending a little more on negative supply stuff if you already have a digital camera and macro lens is the speed and more flexibility using Negative Lab Pro, which is a plug-in for Lightroom. Having that and all of the color tweaking tools that come with that so you can get your scans looking exactly like you want is extremely valuable. And I think really makes the process of shooting film more worthwhile for a lot of people because you're actually happy with your images when you get them and not disappointed from lab scans that you get two months later, which is the most devastating feeling yeah. ever. With blown highlights and you're like, it's like, oh, I spent so much money on this and yeah. I'm so sad. Yeah. yeah. Rip. I'm just thinking of all those photos all that this happened to. Yeah. Um, Alexander Goki asks, are you guys starting a production and design house? If so, how do I apply as a retoucher? <laughs> Super flattering. Thank you for even asking that. Yeah. <laughs> we are starting a production house. Talk about it, Gene. Yeah. We all have separate businesses um, that we've been operating and owning for years and years now, but uh, really with the progression of the work that we've done together in the past year and a half now, um, especially working on the documentary together, it's made a lot of sense for us, even when we got the space, to now begin collaborating and doing work under one company. And so we're still figuring that out as far as details. We've already begun doing some commercial jobs together as a group. Uh, but the details of it, we're still figuring out. But that is very much a plan moving forward for us as we book bigger jobs uh, to do together. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah, we just wrapped a three-day shoot today. We, did. Uh, we went, are you drinking a beer right now? I didn't even notice. He's been drinking yeah. a beer. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was the only assignment I had for Coffee. this episode was for you guys to bring beers oh, man, up. I, my coffee's over there. <laughs> I don't have anywhere to put it. Oh, man, no beverage. Uh, yeah, we just... We just had an electric three-day shoot. It was phenomenal. Really, it's really coming easy to us having worked together so much the past year and a half. And I mean, at this rate, since we like formalized wanting to do it, we're getting inquiries like every week without even marketing at this point. So, Which is pretty insane to think about. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense though, because like how much work we've put into our YouTube channels and like our public facing things and it makes me really excited that we're embarking on this because it's just going to give us so much more to t of sub substance to talk about you know like not make everything so meta in our lives and in our content and work mm -hmm. but like truly being like no we worked on this really meaningful project and yeah. here's all the nuance and creativity that we poured into it versus just like this is why I'm using this camera for production, you know, or this is why I'm shooting with this camera. Like there's, there's a place for that for sure. I'm, I personally, am just sick of that game. Yeah. And anytime I do it, I want to bring like a new nuance to it. So I feel like this is just going to, 
be satisfying in a whole different kind of way and just give us opportunities to use the tools that we talk about all the time. Yeah. Like in a, perf like yeah. I think of the backyard scene you guys shot with direct flash yesterday. Yeah. I'm like, have we ever photographed anything like that mm -mm. outside like that? Mm -mm. Nor have digital? we, nor have we used strobe lights to overpower the sun yeah. and make that our key yeah. in broad daylight. And they're insane images. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, with all of that now, like we're about to hop on a call in an hour soon and then one next week that's probably going to involve hiring more people at creative club to tackle these jobs because we just we're already kind of at a place where like well we can't keep traveling we can't split up the three of us even more so we're gonna have to just get yeah. more hands on deck for specific projects mm -hmm. and obviously given the nature of our work environment we're gonna reach out to creative club folks first yeah but we i could totally see a world where we're building out contractors and um, associates that are doing jobs for us, even nationwide, totally like in different cities and creating some sort of house that's not just local to Chicago, yep. but like having trusted people in different cities and then managing all that uh, yep. locally. 100%. So yeah. it's not happening right now, but it could very well be a possibility in the future with yeah. building a roster in different places. And the production house is going swimmingly yep. so far, and it is very fun. And we are going to make an episode full-blown about the process of the more legal formations that come along with that. We were just researching some of that this week about multi-member LLCs and what the tax implications are and just what those steps look like. And to your point, Eric, about doing less meta stuff, mm -hmm. I think episodes like that too and the real world experience of going through things that other people have questions about and tackling things that are very concrete and very practically helpful to other people including ourselves is really exciting because it's just it's it's like actually building something yeah. it's not just talking circles around this that or the other topic that's you know like kind of applicable it's like we're actually building stuff in the world yep. and that feels really good yeah Next question from at Bran Santos. What is a show or movie that you've recently watched that has inspired the heck out of you? I know my answer. Here's a su succession. Succession. Oh, I don't know Which, if I have an right now. I haven't seen it's it. It's the best show on TV currently. It's amazing. It's absolutely phenomenal. Go watch it if you haven't. Also, The Bear on Hulu. Yeah. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Season two comes out in June. Yeah, I think The Bear for me, too. Yeah. Even though I watched that last year, but that's the one that comes to mind for me, too. Yeah. I feel like the black sheep in this conversation in our niche. Movie and TV? Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't watch it. Do you <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, surely you have, like, iconic <laughs> movies that you love. I'm like, bro, I haven't even seen half of them. <laughs> like, I haven't seen The Godfather. I haven't seen Fight Club. Like... I get chastised so much for all the things I haven't watched. I know something you watched recently that you liked. Inside by Bo Burnham. Apple TV. Yeah. Uh, yep. Shrinking. Yeah. Love it. There you go. I, that was going to be my answer. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> but then my other answer is uh, I've been following Kofuzi for a long time, uh, running YouTuber, but he's been making these like short documentary pieces called a runner's weekend. Every time he goes out to a race. And seeing someone document, it's like not vlog style, but voiceover and just like a whole mixed media bag of stuff with his voiceovers are fantastic. And he includes food and he did one on Tokyo that was an hour long. And it's just like, he immerses you in the experience of doing that thing. And someone who likes running marathons, it's just like, it's such a visceral experience to partake in those. And it's just really cool to see someone do it that, intensely and that strategically mm -hmm. and so it's it's really inspiring me to be more intentional about the things that i make love that super cool even if it's not like stylistically anything near what i do yep i, I actually like that more i like things that don't look like my work yeah m more gox was really yeah. big recently too yeah. absolutely yeah. We're gonna take things up a notch, go a little more rapid fire. Ooh. These next couple, okay. Batting practice. At a, yeah, Ooh. batting practice for a Q and I like that. Do you, are you just gonna like say our name and then do it? No. I'm just gonna say the question. I want like it, one word or one sentence. One word. Let's one. see how quickly you can answer some of these because okay. I think some of these are a little more like quick. At David Masillo Photography asks, go to meal before a photo shoot. 
Coffee, protein bar, not too much food. Yeah. Yeah. RX bar coffee. Yeah. 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 I don't do much. Yep. I, don't, I don't like to be full. Nope. No, I don't like to be stuffed before. Yeah. Before a shoot Big like bar that. banana. Yep. Easy. At Alex Mo photo, name one RF lens that doesn't currently exist that you would purchase immediately if it were released. Oh, dang. 28. 28 Prime. RF 28. 28 Prime. Really? They yes. do not have a 28. I would buy it immediately. That's what I was thinking. 28 Prime. 28. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I feel like that's probably, we can't all three buy it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're just gonna want to share. It. Okay, fine. I want I want a, a fifteen to five hundred f one point two. Okay. <laughs> uh, do they do they have a fifty tilt shift? They they're making still tilt don't in RF. Yeah, they're making tilt shifts. Yeah, so. I feel like I don't know. I don't need that, but I would want it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh. Cool. At Seth Manley asks, "What do you guys do in slow seasons?" I'm in that currently, but also burnt out. I don't know what to do next. Run, run. There you go. Run. No, you don't. <laughs> That's not true. You do yeah. sometimes. Slow you season. You um, work out. Yeah. Uh, non photo like, yeah, workout, exercise, basketball. Yeah. You know? Exercise, music, reading. Yeah. Yep. The personal pleasures in life. Uh, at davidj.mp4, when is the next Creative, Cl Creative Club Chicago event happening? Mm. That's a great question. This summer. This Hopefully summer for sure. A lot this summer. This summer. Yeah. yeah. Well, what about beers and cameras? summer. Hmm? It's not in Creative Club, but Beers and Cameras. Uh, yeah, it's already beer, sold out. It's already sold out. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Dang it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Nick Richards, our boy, still. Oh, What's, What's up, up? dude? Nick. Uh, if you get to do BTS photography for any film, past or present, which one is it? Ooh. E.T. E.T. Okay. E.T. is a good one. Lord of the Rings for me. Ooh. Damn, any of the Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Yeah. yeah. Lord of the Rings. It'd be so fun. Be amazing. Man. I think. Jurassic Park oh, would also be sick. Jurassic Park would be yeah. cool. I might want to take my back. I okay. might want to do La La Land. Oh, oh that would be amazing. Like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All fantastic. I feel like we could riff on this one for a while, actually. Yeah, this, is, this is one that could you go You said on. just movies? Uh, but yeah, movie, you said, you said past or present. Any film past or present. The Batman would have been sick, too. Batman. <laughs> yeah, it would have. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That one really inspired me. That was The Batman? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It was beautiful. I'm really looking forward to Tetris as well. I haven't. On what? Oh, I thought you were kidding. No, <laughs> on Apple TV, Tetris. <laughs> With uh, Taron Edgerton? Yeah. 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 That actually looks like weirdly good. Yeah. I, I like, like him. Apple TV is kind of killing it with the stuff. Yeah, they me. are. Yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. It's really good stuff. Uh, at LBigs20, which project have you guys had the most fun making collectively or individually? I'm going to jump in quickly and say Leica was easily one of our favorite collective projects. No doubt. Yeah. Leica. Yeah. I really enjoyed cutting the first doc trailer too. Yes, that was amazing. It like very fulfilling, especially given the response from the small group of people we've sent it to. Hundred percent. Like big, big names. Yes, and it's just very exciting. It's insane. <laughs> yeah, like a doc. Anything last year? Okay. Yeah. yeah great. Uh, at underscore J Oliver. Quick forty-five second review of the Road Pod mic. I'll give you a quick ten-second review. If you, no, you are, take all 45 seconds because I know nothing about it. Great. Okay. Uh, buy it. It's great. It's amazing. Uh, use it. It's the best microphone you can get for the money. If you're interested in voiceover work or podcasting or anything, uh, you can absolutely make it sound very close to an SM7B and no one would ever notice the difference. It's a fantastic value. But Stephen, what kind of recorder do you need? Because not everybody has a roadcaster. Um, if you don't have a roadcaster, my initial setup for rally caps way back when was a hundred dollar interface with a cloud lifter and a pod mic. And I had fantastic audio cloud lifter, results. but it was like a Raven or something. What uh, was Scarlett TI two, no Scarlett two I two interface. And how much is that all together? Uh, with the mic bucks? and the cloud lifter and the interface, like three fifty. Three fifty. Yeah. Incredible entry level start. Like, I mean, we're using it right now. It's not even entry yeah, level. Yeah, don't like, get an SM7B. No, it's, it's honestly not worth it. It's just not. It's it's a it's a great mic. I think it's a little overrated for what it's worth. Uh, the pod mic, you get so much more bang for your buck out of it. And I think the big thing, like with a lot of things, is understanding how to uh, do more of the technical side of audio rather than just buy the gear that everyone yeah. uses. Use an SM7B in a bad room. Sounds bad. Honestly, like in the beginning when you had your SM7B plugged into the C200 yeah. in the old studio, it sounded really bad yeah. because there was no cloud lifter helping the preamps Just and hissing. you had a really echoey room. Yep. Like you can buy all the expensive equipment you want, but if you don't know how to treat a room properly or how to use that equipment well, you're just losing out. Like you're it's wasting bad. money. So it's bad. just buy this Thanks. and then learn more about audio on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, hey, Levi asked a question. Uh, how do you charge for film photography in commercial work? Have you done that? Not in my commercial work, only in weddings. I kind of did it once for like set photography for a commercial. Yeah. It's you have to have a very specific client who wants that. Yeah. Because like the client we shot for today was definitely not that vibe. No, not at all. Yeah. So I wish I had a better answer. Yeah. I charged like a day rate when I was on set. But you like year. strictly shot film. Yeah. No, that was my job was to be a film photographer behind the scenes. Because that's the aesthetic that they wanted. Yes. I don't think it happens too often that people want both. For like the actual delivered. Yeah. Yeah. Unless like unless you're shooting yeah. for a brand where you know they would really love the aesthetic of film, yeah, then you pitch that. Yep. And I feel like if you pitch that, it just obviously needs to be worth it. I feel like this is a good question for Forrest Mankins. It is a very good question. Yeah. Just, he could answer this really well. Just text him. I'll text him real quick and ask. <laughs> um, yeah. No, th I think this would be perfect. I almost feel like film needs to be a part of your style. Yeah. And then it's just built into your pricing right. rather than adding it on because I think it's harder to upsell film to a commercial client than it is to like a wedding client. 100%. Yes. It's harder to explain they, the they value They won't see as much it. value in it. Yeah. So I think just making it a part of your aesthetic period and then that the thing that people that's just a want really, to hire you for. That's a really risky thing to do though because... To make film a part of your style? Yeah. Now as a business in my opinion because you just you don't know what your costs are going to be week to week, month uh, to month. Yeah. Like they they just keep going up. Yeah. So to make that a core part of your style and aesthetic. Yeah. Like just starting now, you're like, yeah. Oh man, like yeah. that's, that's that's tough. True. Yeah. But if you have an approach like Forrest, where like he can essentially make his digital stuff look exactly like his medium format work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're not yeah. like your client's not going to know the difference. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, at Spencer Daniel asks Spencer. honestly, just love you all. Uh -oh. That's super love sweet. You Spencer. Uh, Great. Love that. He's awesome. I keep going through. Uh, at Clay Terrell. Clay, you're the man. How did you find a studio space? A friend and I are striking out on our own right now. No pun intended. I don't. Where are they based? You That's know? a great question. Clay? Uh, I think he's in Nashville. I just did his branding. <laughs> I think he's in Nashville. Uh, it's, I mean, when you live in a major city like Chicago, there's yeah. a dime a dozen. You know, it's tough. Um, I feel like we were incredibly fortunate to find this building and this company that leases these spaces. Yeah, for sure. Because they're like relatively affordable in, in a major city. But I do think the way to go, like someone I think of is Asher James. He's up in uh, Duluth, Minnesota, mm -hmm. and he's starting something very similar to Creative Club, mm -hmm. but he's doing it as a group of people, like with a group of people. Yeah. So I think that more people you have on board, like the more chances you're going to have to get a place because something might be out of your budget. But if you have more people to split the cost, mm -hmm. then you might be willing to pull the trigger on something that might be more expensive, yeah. which long-term is going to be more beneficial for you because it's just going to be a better spot. Yep, It's going to look better, feel better, probably be in a better location, not be falling apart. You'll actually want to go and use it. Yeah. Um, our buddy Alec has a couple questions for us. Oh. Um, and they include, what is the best place? Who has the most teeth out of you three? What was the most of the documentary? What was the most of well, the documentary? What was the most of the documentary? <laughs> <laughs> Who has the most teeth? Yes. <laughs> Wait, do we not have the same amount of teeth? Is that? No, well, it depends. Unless you had some you wisdom teeth or pole oh. or, you know. Well, it reminds, me, it reminds me of what um, Andy from, uh, <laughs> from Parks and Rec, it, one of his outtakes was just like, I was born with a full head of hair and a full head of teeth. <laughs> 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 I guess we're all born with a full head of teeth. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is not out yet. Which is a wild thing. It's pretty insane like, to, think, to think, that. think that a baby has adult teeth up in there. It's like, <laughs> what? And baby teeth. <laughs> both sets just up yeah, in both that sets. skull. Yeah. That is so bizarre oh. when you think about that. Okay. Alec like, did apologize for the spam. And then he did say, for real. What was the most challenging part of creating the documentary? And uh, he said, "What's your favorite place?" He's like, "What's the best? What's place? the best place?" <laughs> yeah. He asked, "What What is the most challenging part of the creating the documentary?" And uh, another user had asked that as well. 
So that is a well. A let's very answer some of the other topic. questions earnestly. Oh, quick. oh, you want to? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Did great. you get your wisdom teeth removed, Gene? No, I haven't. So he has the most. Yeah, I got mine removed. Wow! Congratulations, Gene. Thanks. All right. So Gene has the most teeth of the three of us. That's great. Hey, Gene, because you're the winner of that <laughs> no, weird no, no, question. No, no, no. What is the best? What's place? the best place? <laughs> the best place? Yeah, best place. Chuck E. Cheese, dude. <laughs> oh, dude, Chuck E. We went there last year, or last week for our staycation. It was wonderful. <laughs> It was so much Shut fun. Up. They we went to Charles a quality cheese. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's Are you, you Charles a quality there? cheddar? They've never been, so we took them because Sophie was asking. It's and pretty good. You though. lived with I've the mouse? Been, we lived with him. It's, I've been there 25 years. It's not sketchy anymore. <laughs> no, it's clean. Yeah, they rebranded. Oh, did they actually? Yeah, yeah. it's very different. Chucky, Wait, you Chucky's stayed like, there? He looks very different. No, no, no. We just played there. Oh, you just played we didn't there. Stay there. <laughs> what you said last year? Oh, for like they had, a, like they have a hotel. A oh, it's all good. No, it's like <laughs> the Chuck E. Cheese. Is it a resort now? <laughs> it's like that'd be such a weird pivot for them. <laughs> okay, but then Alex' last question is basically the same as a serious one. Yes. What was the most of the documentary? <laughs> 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 what was the most challenging part of creating the documentary? And there was some general interest in that specific question from mm. other users. I think just relation building, relationship building and trust building with Joe. And time away from home. Time away from home. And getting yeah. sick. It was very tough. Time away from home. A lot of travel. A lot of travel. Yeah. Even bringing families on trips was really difficult in its own right. Expectations of like, we're, we're just kind of working the whole trip anyway. Yeah. So yeah, we're physically present with one another, but not really. Yeah. Because we're just stressing about the next thing we need to shoot and the yep. importance of that day of shooting. So little downtime yep. on those trips. Yeah. It's we got go, sick. Go, go. I got sick like every single trip. Yeah. Which meant by proxy, we often got sick too. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty rough. It was tough. Gene, yeah. anything else beyond that? I don't think so. I mean, yeah. it was also um, like most things in life, our first time tackling something that large at that scale. And it's just a lot of learning moments of figuring things out. Like if we did it again, I think there's a lot of things that we wouldn't do the same or that we'd do differently. But um, yeah, just like, I think shooting a doc in general is just difficult as well. So, yeah. Yeah. A feature length film is no joke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Especially when it's not planned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <There's> <laughs> when it too. becomes a feature length film. I mean, it's, it's hard in a completely different way. You just like looking at Danny's BTS and production, like yeah. trying to squeeze that in 36 days is, absolutely insane and it's insane in its own right like i i do believe that that was more tiring and more exhausting it was just in a shorter window an intense window of time whereas ours was like strewn out over the course of an entire year yeah and still going i full i prefer that it, what danny did looked like a living hell honestly yeah. and so. when we talked to him about it at his wedding when we photographed it it certainly sounded like it too like yeah. it looked he was getting like three four hours of sleep a night yeah at, at most uh, and it's oh my gosh i can't even imagine surviving that amount of pressure and stress it's oh it looked brutal yeah so tough um at tom roger mailhat what's up tom we'll see you in may for your wedding uh mm -hmm. how do you bring your passions and dreams into your career and your job i think we're currently living it yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. it just it is what it is currently yeah, it like, is our job the stuff that we do is what we love it is our passion agreed it has become our job and it's amazing. Yeah. At Michael Bornman, what do you look for when hiring people? And this could be maybe on a like a contractor basis or just anytime we are outsourcing work. Something along those lines. For me, the work needs to stand out in a unique way. I I'm not interested in hiring anyone that's just like doing the same thing as everyone else. Whether it's photography or videography or editing i want to see a, a unique approach i i guess then like when working would just want to see initiative that's intrinsic mm -hmm. and not not me just always telling the person what to do but them actually coming up to me and be like hey i, I already initiated this thing or i did the thing you asked me to do and i also did this it's like being intentional and above and beyond on things or even Ryan Booth, like during race week, doing things like washing dishes, like things like that 
stand out so much greater mm -hmm. than just being a good editor, just being a good photographer. Being a good person goes person. a really long way. Yeah, it does. It's amazing. There's a philosophy that I like to stick to and it's simple. It's work hard and be nice to people. Mm -hmm. and it's a absolutely incredible how far that will take you in life, especially in this industry that we are in where a lot of it is built on relationships. Yeah. A lot of it is based on mouth to mouth Whoa. Wait, word of mouth. That's the phrase <laughs> oh, I was looking for. Geez. Mouth to mouth referrals. That's what I wanted to call them just now instead of word of mouth referrals. <laughs> I want that. I, I like fully, I was like really trying to think of what that phrase was. Give me that beer. Mouth to mouth. Word of mouth referrals. That's the cold open right there. <laughs> 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 but it's true. Like it is, it's yeah. people vouching for other people and like actually sticking their necks out for yeah. a referral. Yeah. And it makes a world of difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last ones. Michael, our boy, Michael, H and P photography. Aww. When can I come visit the studio? I'll bring donut. Dude, whenever, whenever, yeah. just give us a heads up. Come on over. Yep. Laura asked how I am so cool. Please answer. I'll, Explain that to her later. And uh, Shua did ask a question to close Ooh. us out. What are some of the things you would do better on a film project from pre-production to post? Data management. Yeah, always. that is 100% it's it. always data management. That's it. You're just, just like, manage you're like, your yeah, I got all the well. cards clear, but I did not think about where it's all going to go. Yep. Yep. Dang it. Got to clear off... The the computer, that's what we're running into today. Clean it's, up the computer, clean up this SSD, move with the other stuff, blah, 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 blah. I think that's the real test of a professional is all of the peripheral things. Yeah. It's making true. sure data is ready, data is managed in the proper way, batteries are charged, all yeah. the accessories are taken care of and organized well. It's all of the little things that I think can really screw you over in a project like yeah. that with data management absolutely being the top one. And yeah. a checklist for gear. Always helps. So gear doesn't get lost or yep. you don't forget. Because a lot of times the stuff that you forget on set is, it's not necessary, but you're like, oh, it's just going to make it that much harder. Yep. You're like forgetting ba batteries for the monitor. Yep. Oh, like, yep. That's what we ran into yesterday. It's fine. It's just not as easy now. Mm -hmm. Another A, a C-stand head. Got the arm oh and God. the body, but not the head. <laughs> and we're like, ah. It's like, why is the head not here? That's stupid. <laughs> Steven's going to be a human C stand right now. Yeah. 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 Or I'll pretend to be a father, <laughs> which is what I ended up do doing that. for that scene. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Always manage your data well. Can't stress that enough. Yeah. It's the big one. Hey, we did it. Yeah. The Q&A episode that was waiting for like a month. <laughs> we did it. Yeah, it's it was pretty low energy, but I, I dug the vibes. Okay, yeah. Yeah. We're just chill, I mean. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I feel cool. like, I, yeah, I guess I started off real goofy and then got, like, real tired. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm really tired right now. <laughs> just, Are we talking about running? No? Uh, I'm not interested. <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> Hate podcasting. Dang it. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, we have to close. Um, hey, thanks for watching, listening. Appreciate you. Love you very much. We'll see you next week with another episode. And if you're not following, subscribed already, please do it. All three of us would appreciate it. Thank you. Right, Gene? Yes, okay. always. Right, Eric? Yeah. Great. <laughs> of course. All right. Okay. Lo low energy goodbye. Sorry. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>